Amen. Open your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 8. Yes, I love Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Now there is a little bit of confusion in Romans chapter 8, but let's read what the Word says here in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to His purpose. That is a tremendous scripture. However, some people have reworded that slightly to say all things that happen must have come from God because it's all going to work out anyway. But that's not what that scripture says. Not everything comes from God, even though some people will declare that. God has certain things on his mind. He wishes that no man should perish, but that all men should come to everlasting life. So when someone dies without the Lord, that's not God's plan. But they would say anything that happens is the will of God. No, it says all things will work together for good. It'll work together for good, but there's two categories that they work. For those that love God. And how do we show that we love God? According to the scripture, if you keep his commandments, you love God. If you keep his commandments, you love God. Now, in many translations it says this, keep the commands of God. We understand commandments, but the word is keep the commands of God. Now somebody says, well there's a lot of commands of God. Well according to the scripture, it says you can compile all these into this one thing. Love God with all your, uh, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love is the ultimate word for keeping the command of God. Love is very important. And love is very important. However, he does diverse that love into every single person's area as he wishes. And we should do according to the plan of God. Sometimes he'll say, hey, take a pie to your neighbor. And we go, I rebuke you. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I don't have any feeling for a pie besides that or barely even know that person. He's trying to get them saved. He's giving you an opportunity to be the catalyst to bring them to the kingdom. And we sometimes deny the fact of God because we say, well, this isn't God's uh, word to me. But it is. It is him that gives us a divine provision for purpose. He gives us, a, the Bible says, according to his purpose. He, for those that love God and according to his purpose. Called according to his purpose. If you're called according to his purpose, you're walking in the will of God. That's according to his purpose. And he provides for you while you're in his will. If you'll walk in the will of God, he says, I'm going to provide for you all along the way. Now there's provision that's in the purpose. He gives us provision. As you're in his purpose, he makes a provision. There's always a way. He says it's all going to work out. There's always a way. There's a provision if you're in the purpose of God. Now some people don't walk in the purpose of God and they say, how come God's not taking care of me? Well, you're not even near the umbrella where his praise and his glory is, is, is extended. You're walking off on some path on your own and you want God to bless what you're doing instead of doing what God's blessing. Amen. So he says, this is what I want you to understand. I've given you a provision, and that provision is for purpose. Some people don't understand when they're blessed, when they are favored, and they receive something. It's for the blessing. It's for the favor. It's for the purpose of God. If you can sing, it's for the purpose of God. If you can speak, you ought to use it for the purpose of God. That's what he gave it to you for. Your IQ, your talent, your finances... Some people get confused about their finances. They think, well, I've got enough money. God's just blessing me. It's for a purpose. It's not only so you have enough, but so that you can bless everyone else. He wants you to start to use it to bless others. It's going to make you have more because you realize that's your purpose. Some people are called to a ministry of finances. And they haven't yet arrived. They're saying, well, I've got enough to cover my bills, so I'm okay now. Well, you're okay now, but you're not in the purpose of God because it's supposed to be overflowing where you can give to every single good work. Amen. Now, we talked last week a little bit about Ruth. Ruth has four chapters. We spoke a little bit about Ruth, and I knew at the beginning of the teaching I was not going to finish that day. <laughs> so I said, okay, Lord, then what would you have me do? He said, just continue next week. Well, that made sense. So we studied Ruth. Ruth and her husband were living in Bethlehem and there was a drought 
And so they felt, or was compelled, they felt an unction to move to a Moabite land. They moved there with the Moabites because at least they could have enough. There was something to be taken care of there. So they went to the land of Moabite and while they were there in Moab, they were having their needs met. But then in Moab things started changing. So they knew by the Spirit of God they needed to go back to Bethlehem. But the two sons that had been born to Naomi and her husband, first the husband died, and then the two sons died. And Naomi's just saying, now what do I, well, now what do I do? I'm going back to where I was supposed to come from. So she knew that I got to go back to Bethlehem. She had the two daughter-in-laws. One of them decided to go on home, but one of them, Ruth, stayed with her. Went all the way back to Bethlehem and said, your God will be my God. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to serve your God. I'm going to serve you. Let's do it. So then we look at what happened. Ruth gets all the way back to Bethlehem, and she asks Naomi, we got to at least have our needs met. We got to do something. I know some way. I'll go down to the gleaners. Anybody been to the gleaners? Here they have a place they call the gleaners. That's where food is taken. It's, it's what was left in the field. Yeah, well, she was picking up what was left in the field. So she went down there. At least her needs were met. She had enough for her and Naomi. The needs were met. In Ruth chapter 2 and verse 16, the Bible says, the Bible says, some more than just her needs got met because Boaz, who owned the field, told the, glee, told the reapers who'd been reaping the field, Hey, that girl, that one girl, boy, she's a delight to look at, that one girl right there, that Ruth girl. Ooh. Leave some handfuls, special, just for Ruth to pick up. No longer just to the coals that's left over, but leave her some of the extra produce and stuff. Just leave stuff left around so she can just pick that up. So she goes there, and according to the Bible in Ruth 2.16, it says, Also let the grain from your bundles fall purposefully, purposeful, there's a purpose, purposefully for her, for Ruth, leave it that she may also pick it up when she's gleaning. She'll see the extra wheat, she'll see the extra bundles there, she'll just pick it up when she's gleaning and don't you even talk to her, don't rebuke her, don't stop her, don't do anything. She's supposed to get this, I declare it. So here she goes and she picks up this grain. Now, this was left on purpose. This was in the purpose of Boaz, which was in the purpose of God. He leaves her stuff strategically. Folks, I'm telling you what, this is how God's favor works for us. He leaves you stuff strategically. Does it seem like sometimes situations come and it's just a little overwhelming? Like some things are, you have a little something happen and then just a few minutes later, you have something else happen, and just before you get that taken care of, you have something else happen. It's like, I've got all these things going on. When you have all that kind of stuff happening, God says, it's time to pour out favor. He's around, he's ready to pour out stuff and leave you things hanging out in the field so you can have it all taken care of. He is providing for you. It says that all things work together for the good that those that love God, he's going to take care of it. Now, some people say, well, I've not seen that. I, I haven't seen that. And this is why. Look at James chapter 1 and verse 14. In James 1, 14 it says, But each one, when he is tempted, and some people don't understand temptation. Temptation also means a test or a trial. When you have a trial such as this, when you have a talent, or you have money, or you have abilities, like a singing ability, and you just want to hoard it up for yourself. Sometimes we don't see that this was made and given to us on purpose. The provision is in the purpose. We give it to the Lord. He's going to provide for us. He said he'll take care of us. Now, sometimes we don't see that, so we take whatever we get and we just take care of ourselves with it. Some people have a singing talent. They just take care of themselves with it. Forget all that with God. They have money coming in. Well, that's just for me. I'm going to get me a boat. And I'm going to get me a house. I'm going to get me a little. I'm going to get me some new clothes. I'm going to get me a new pair of shoes. Oh, glory to God. And another purse. I don't even know what I'd do with the purse. Are you with me? So, but some people say, this is what this is for. This purpose must be for this just to take care of me. 
In James 1 it says, in verse 14, each one when he is tempted, when he goes through a test, when he's in a trial, he can be drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Now this is a fishing term. It's a fishing term. To be drawn away and enticed is a fishing term. It's found in the Greek word. It's a fishing term. It means to bait the hook. Some of you understand if you've ever been fishing, you take a worm, you're not feeding the fish, you're baiting the fish. You're trying to hook it up so that the fish grabs onto the hook and you got them. This is exactly what the devil does to people. They don't understand it. If they have a talent and they go, ooh, this is nice, and they start to use up the talent and they get hooked and they don't even realize they're not being able to give to the Lord because they're hooked on what they're using for themselves. They don't give it to God. And this is where we're supposed to stay in his purpose. Stay in in his purpose. There's provision in the purpose. Now, I said all that to say this. Some people don't understand this, but there's levels of favor. Now somebody said, well, well what are you talking about? There's levels of favor. If I could show you in the Word, would that help describe the levels of favor? Let's take a look. Let's take a look at Luke 6, Luke 6, and we'll get to verse 38. Now hang on just a second. When you've got a blessing or you've got something wonderful that's happened, what do you want to do? You want to tell somebody. You know, even when we have, listen, we find $60 on the street. We, tell, we call two or three friends. You, i got to tell you what happened to me. <laughs> Let me just tell you what happened to me. And so they, well they go, here's what you usually do. Instead of just starting out with your story, how do you start? You start with the niceties. So how are you? Uh-huh. Good. And how's the kids? Fine. Uh, and you're just trying to, you're formulating your conversation in such a way that you can maneuver it into letting them know what happened to you. So you're moving the situation in such a way by your conversation. You could care less about them. You want to tell them what just happened to you. So you get them to understand, yes, I'm, I'm concerned about you and I'm thinking about you and everything's okay. Now ask me about me. Ask me. About, and they go, what about you? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> So you start the story and you say, oh, I just would happen to be walking down the street and there was $60 laying on the ground. There was three $20 bills and I picked them up. I picked them up. There was three $20 bills. I put them in my pocket. I said, glory to God, that's the favor of God. Can you see that's the favor of God? And you want to tell them how excited you are. And they usually say something like this. Well, isn't that nice? Because <laughs> it didn't happen to them. So they can't understand how come you're so excited about your blessing when they're not blessed. People don't get it. And here's what happens to people. If we are blessed of God, we want to share. I'm privileged to understand a specific situation that happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Right after the time when we were there, we lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma six years. And there was a family that had joined there to go to a ministry school. And while they were going to school, they were living in a little apartment. And when I heard this story, I said, this sounds kind of familiar. Living in a little apartment. And they got tired of apartment living. So they said, I think we want to move. So they told the Lord, we would like to move. And the Lord said, pray for an entire six months about the favor of God. That you walk in divine favor. And they said, that's an awful long time to be having to say that. Why can't we just say it once or twice and walk out the door and have it happen? Because the Lord said, I'm going to get your mind renewed to this idea that favor is yours now. But it's going to take a refreshing and a renewal of your mind to think the favor's upon you now. So they heard this and they began to say, favor of God's on me now. And it went along six months, half the year in the first year of their ministry school. And they began to say it, oh, favor of God's on me, the favor of God's on me. They didn't see any difference. They lived in that little apartment. But came a time, they finally said, after six months, we want to get into a place of our own. So they got a realtor, and they said, can you help us find a place? We want to get a place of our own. It's important. 
So the realtor took them out and showed them what they could afford and they said, you know, it's, it's not everything that we were really looking for. And the realtor said, well, this is what you can afford. This is what you can qualify for. And they said, that's, 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 you know, maybe we should look somewhere else. So the realtor took them somewhere else to look and they started saying, oh, this it's getting a little bit nicer. And they looked at about a dozen houses and they didn't see what they wanted in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And they looked and they said, you know, just not finding what I want. And finally they told the Lord, they said, well, I'm, I'm, we're praying for favor. What's the deal? Said, call the realtor back and tell her, show us a house that you would buy. And so they called her back and said, what kind of house would you buy? So the realtor took them to a ritzy area. <laughs> and they saw the house and they saw the for sale sign. They went, Ooh, and then they went, la la, and they they'd take me inside. And they walked around and looked at the place. It's about 2,500 square feet. And they said, this is nice. Got a full acre. It's a really nice place. It got four bedrooms. This seems, this is, this is great. And the realtor said, yeah, it's a lot above your means. And they looked at it and said, you know, maybe you can make them an offer. And the realtor said, well, it has been on the market for a little while. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps they'd consider it. It's been on about six months. So the realtor looked at him and said, you know, what kind of offer would you make? And they said, how about half? And the realtor said, you can afford that. <laughs> But you can't afford this. And, and she said, well, you know, I, I guess I'm obligated to make your bid anyway. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something up front. Six months ago, we had another person try to get this house and offer $10,000 below the list price. And they turned them down. That's real encouraging when you hear stuff like that right after you've just decided to offer half price. So they offered half price. And it went in, and sure enough, the next day they got a word back, and the realtor came back and said, well, like I said, it probably wouldn't consider it, but for whatever reason, they took it. <laughs> and they said, that's the favor of God, that's what that is. <laughs> that's the favor of God. When you have something like that happen, you want to share it. And this happened after we left Tulsa. They got this house. And I was so excited to hear that because I said, that's favor of God right there. We need to get ourselves lined up to receive. Now, would you like to understand the levels of the favor of God? Look at Luke 6 and verse 38. Because if you're in joy, there's a level of joy. If you're in peace, there's levels of peace. If you're in victory, there's levels of victory. Even if you're in ministry, there's levels of ministry that come according to the favor of God. If you listen to how these, these blessings come, these favors come. Look at this, Luke 6, 38. And here's what it says. Give and it shall be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaking together and running over will be put into your bosom for with the same measure that you use it will be measured back to you now I've read this verse hundreds of times but while I'm reading this verse this time the Lord says these are the levels of favor I went I don't think I've ever seen that before You'll have to explain it to me. I did one of those Ricky and Lucy things. You have to explain it to me. So he says, look at this. Here's what I want you to see. There's good measure. There's good measure. This is where you have enough. Somebody says, well, that's good measure. I got just enough. I got enough. I got enough. If you got your bills paid, I've heard people tell me, well, I don't have everything I want, but I've got all my needs met. You're in the first level. You just made it to the first level. You, you got enough. Good measure. Good, are you with me? That's good measure. Then it says, press down. Press down. Well, now you got some room for more. 
Okay, Lord, thank you so much. I'm moving up. Oh, glory to God. I'm dragging one foot, but I'm moving up. Are you with me? He says it's pressed down. Then he said, now this part is the third one, shaken together. This is where it's densely compacted together to a close-knit area so that not only do you have it pushed down, but he says now it's shaken down and all the areas are compacted and pushed in together. Some people understand this in a science project. You take a bottle and you put in there a bunch of rocks. And you say, well, is that jar full? And people say, yeah, that jar's full. But then you can take little sand and you pour about a gallon of sand in the same jar and it fills up all the little areas where the rocks are and you go, is the jar full? Yeah, the jar's full. Then they take a gallon of water and they say, watch this. And they pour the water in where the sand was, where the rocks already are, and it starts to fill up and there's still some room. And they say, what's going on? Now it's getting full. Are you with me? This is where it's starting to get full, but they put another gallon in, and all of a sudden it's running over. And they say, okay, now it's full. Now it's full. Every single area is full. These are levels that the Lord's trying to bless us. Many of us get to the first level where we say, okay, my needs are met, and we go, that's it. I'm, I have arrived. Yeah. I'm on, the fir I'm on the first level. God's taking care of me. Yeah. God is taking care of me. Yeah, your needs are met. We think Philippians 4.19 is all there is. Yeah. Got to meet all my needs according to his risen glory by Christ Jesus. You're on the first step. On. You haven't got in the house. Right. Come on now. Yeah. He wants you to at least start the steps. Get going here. He says this is where I'm taking you to a place called running over. He said then you're going to have a place where it's running over. You're going to be pressed down, shaken together and running over. He's talking about abundant living, more than enough. You've got more than you can even qualify for. You can't even imagine what God has in store for those that love him. This is the highest level of finance. This is the favor of God in its highest form. Yeah. Are you with me? He says, this is what I want to bring to you. If you're with me, say amen. amen. Now Ruth exhibited this in her life. She got to a place where, first of all, she was gleaning in the field. She was gleaning. And because she was pulling up a little bit, she was taking about an opar, she was taking one measure, it's about a bushel, it was enough for her and Naomi to have their needs met. She had her needs met. And she was doing this, she was in just enough. But Boaz saw this beautiful woman and he said, Ruth, whew, get a load of that woman right there. This is something right there. And so he says, I got to help take care of her. And he tells all the people that are reaping. He says, leave her extra when you go through the field. Take from your own bundle handfuls and leave it on the ground so she can pick up strategically. Lay it down so when she's walking by, she just picks up what I have already purposed for her to get. Now this is, somebody said, well this is a favor of God. Yes, but it's only the second level. It's only the second level. Let me explain. This is a welfare mentality. It's been pressed down, but now she's got a little bit more. She was gleaning, she was gleaning, but now she's gleaning and picking up bushels full because she's got whatever has been left for her. Are you with me? Now she's got a little extra. Some people get a little bit extra and they go, oh, I'm being blessed. Oh, really? Yeah, I got $10 this week. Glory to God. <laughs> You know, $10 doesn't go a whole long way at the store. Are you with me? You go in the store and you say, well, I got, a, I, got a, I, got about a, I got about, oh, I got a sack full here today. And they go, what do you have? Let me see here. You got this? Mm -hmm. Got that one? Mm -hmm. Got that one? Okay, that's $24. You don't get a sack with that. Mm -mm. You got to carry that out in your purse. <laughs> you don't get a sack till you get $25 worth. Now, some people say, well, I'm being blessed. But then Boaz... Boaz took her aside and gave her extra, not only was she getting in the field, but he gave her extra six bushels. We're talking about good measure, pressed down. Now it's good measure, pressed down. Now it's shaken together. Now we're talking compressed and tightly fit. She got six bushels. She's trying to carry six bushels home to Naomi. Come on now. She's like, I'm, gonna I'm taking this home. This is a blessing of God. I'm taking this home. And she's toting off this six bushels. Then Ruth becomes Boaz's wife. 
the same field that she was gleaning in now belongs to her. <laughs> Come on now. We're talking about the very thing that we don't even expect. The very area where you've been working one day, if you'll continue to follow the Lord, couldn't be yours. Are you with me? He says the very area, she's got it running over. It's running over. Now look at 2 Corinthians 9. Praise God. This is just the introduction, don't you, don't, don't you know? Now hang on. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and we look at verse 6. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6. But this I say, he that sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. But he that sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. He's trying to tell us something. We're trying to get from faith to faith. We're trying to get from glory to glory. He's trying to get something to you to get you to the next level. He's trying to show you how you can move to the next level. I'm trying to get you to the next level. Now many church people... They get going in the things of God and then they get stuck. They get going because at least my needs are met and they go, well that's, that's good, at least my needs are met. Hallelujah, praise God, thank you Jesus. And some people get a little bit more. They say, hey, I, I, I picked up some stuff that was extra, that was left. Praise God, and, and that's good. And they live from that miracle to miracle. One miracle, and a few months later they get another miracle. And a couple of years later they get another miracle. They're like, oh, praise God, hallelujah. At least, at least I'm having a miracle now and then. Glory, that's good. But when the miracles get closer together, and when the miracles start happening every day, then you got overflowing. And people just want to get around you because you're highly favored. <laughs> Are you with me? This is what the Lord is trying to do for us. Don't get stuck on a level. Get ready to move. This is where God wants us to go. It's okay. Some people like it. They like it in good measure. They like saying just enough. They're happy with just enough. And you say, how you doing? I got my bills paid. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. You know, praise God. Amen. But he's trying to get you to another level. He's trying to get you to another level. Amen. We choose to be satisfied sometimes on the level that before we get to the place where God's trying to take us, where his purpose is, the highest level of favor. And I'm going to encourage you, get to that level. We get frustrated sometimes in life if we're stuck on a level. If you get stuck on a level, at least your needs are met, you can do like this. Well, I wish I had enough money to go to the movie. Well, at least my needs are met. Yeah, glory to God. And we start getting frustrated because we haven't moved to the next level. Amen. I'm helping somebody. Now there's a biblical example of this and this is found in the children of Israel when they were in bondage and found in Ezekiel chapter 16. And then we start looking there at about verse 11. And it says, the Lord spoke to Moses and said this, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them and say this, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning it shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So I was that quails came upon it in the evening and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay on the ground, and, and the surface of it was in the wilderness, a round little substance findeth frost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is this? For they did not know that this was what Moses had said to them. This was the bread the Lord had given them to eat, which the Lord had commanded, let every man gather according to each one's need. It was just having the needs. A little bit more this was kind of a, at least they weren't in bondage. At least their needs were met in bondage, right? Their needs were met in bondage. They ate. They had leeks and garlic. Their needs were met in bondage. They had children. But they're in bondage. Some of us don't understand if you're just at the needs met level, you're kind of still in bondage. You can't get to do what you want to do. You can't go where you want to supposed to. You can't fulfill the purpose if you're still getting just your needs met. You can't give to every good work because your needs are just getting met. Then he says, I'm trying to show you something here, this biblical example. He gave them water from a rock. He gave them a cloud when there was heat. He gave them a pillar of fire when it got nighttime and get cold in the desert. He gave them all kinds of stuff. He gave them manna. He gave them quail. He gave them handfuls of stuff on purpose. Are you with me? But like I said before, this is a welfare mentality. Some people get 
stuck here thinking God's going to take care of me like this all the time. At least he's, he's changing you from one level to another. You can't get stuck here because he's trying to show you I'm trying to get you to another level. And some people get stuck here thinking, well, God helped me like this before. I don't know why he's not doing it now. Because there's another level. And you haven't arrived at that level. God's trying to get you to a level called overflow. And this level is where we sometimes stop along the way because we get satisfied. Or we get frustrated and we end up staying there. I'm helping somebody. Now when I got this from the Lord, I'd never taught this before. I'd never even seen this before. But I said, Lord, I understand this now. I see this. Here's what he told me. He said, look at 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 8. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always, and there's that all verse, I love this all verse. You always having all sufficiency in all things can abound to every good work. You know, sometimes we can't even abound to our own good work. Yeah. Let alone every single good work. He says, I'm trying to help you through this. I want you to abound to every single good work where that is more than enough. More than enough. You got more than enough. It's not just gleaning because you're making enough. It is not just handfuls dropped and you're making press down. It's not just extra given to you in six bushels so it's all shaken together. But he says, I'm trying to have you not be satisfied with just other people's droppings. I'm trying to get you to a place where overflow happens to you all the time. How many would like that? We're talking about a different level. We're talking about a different level. Now, I have walked in just enough. I have walked in press down where the Lord provided. All kinds of stuff provided. Now, I don't mind the provision stage where somebody takes care of me. Now, listen to me. I would prefer a ride to church than just to walk. Are you with me? But I'm a grown man. I want my own car. <laughs> I want my own car. So I told the Lord, I said, it's within your will to give me a car. You know that God has given me more than one car. I am blessed in that. And then we've been praying recently. He said, I'm about to pour on you something you couldn't do yourself. I'm going to give you a car. I have had many blessings in the future. But this is where don't be satisfied with droppings. And don't be satisfied with whether people have. But he says, I'm ready to move you to another level. Everybody listen to me. Get ready to move to another level. I've gleaned before. I've picked up droppings. And in that area, we can become codependent. Instead of just doing what God says to do, we get just satisfied that somebody else is taking care of us. Are you with me? But God says, I'm taking you to another level. Everybody say this. God has taken me to a new level. Now, Ruth in chapter 4 ends up owning the very field that she was gleaning. Now think about this. She was given favor in such a way. And the Lord said, I want you to write this down. This is the title of the service for today. Favor's advantage is upon me. The favor's advantage is upon me. And he said, I want you to see it like that. I put favor on you. He said that to me. I put the favor on you on purpose. The favor's advantage is on you. And anyone that helps you, they'll get the same favor. Amen. He said, here's what I'm trying to do. I'm showing that the favor's advantage is upon me. When I was working, wherever I'd been working, whatever I had been doing and working so hard at, he said, tomorrow you could be owning. Are you with me? Amen. This is a whole different insight to business. Anybody have to work at some place? You say, hmm, if I owned it, I'd do it different. Come on now. You were a candidate. <laughs> He says, this is what I'm trying to show you. I'm trying to take you to another level. Even the handful levels, even the handfuls left over levels. This must have been interesting for Ruth being near the other girls that were there gleaning the field. And all the other girls that were gleaning the field, all these women gleaning the field, but handfuls were being left for, come on now, who was it being left for? Ruth. Because she was highly favored. And so she was picking up this stuff and all the other girls are going, 
Can you believe that? <laughs> she didn't even do anything. She just got bundles. Just bundles left for her. Here they go again. They're just left over there. People talk about you when you receive a favor. You get highly favored and people go, well, of course he's the favorite. This is where God's saying, I'm trying to show you something. Now for me, and I told you the story about the people that were in Tulsa. I looked at that thing and I just, I, I just sat there because it was somebody's testimony in a magazine. And I went, that sounds vaguely familiar. The Lord, this is, I'm going to give you my testimony. Are you ready? The Lord, we went to Bible school and we were in a little apartment. That apartment was so small, the neighbor turned on his speaker and it would rattle my children's bed. <laughs> It was like, Lord Jesus, please don't, uh, don't make us stay here. The any place but here. This, we thought we were moving into a nice place. Now we moved to Bible school with nothing. We had nothing. But we knew that the Lord was sending us there. So we're in Bible school in this little tiny apartment. And there were times we didn't have any food. And I said, Lord Jesus, we don't have any food. I couldn't even go on outings with some of the other church people because I didn't have any food to take. And I said, well, I'll go. And I went anyway. And they said, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm fasting. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> and people come over and say, well, let me give you something. No, I'm fasting. You know, unless, of course, somebody wants to give me something, then the Lord said I could eat it. <laughs> Man, I'm eating that food. I'm like, Lord Jesus, I'm going to take care of them people at home. My folks at home don't have anything. My wife and my kids are just sitting there with no food. I come home and I said, you know, somebody blessed me on a, on a weekend. I was able to eat something. I said, I, I was praying for you. I, I bought a potato chip home. I was, I was praying for you. I was praying, that, I was praying that God would bless you. And we get a ring on the doorbell. And somebody showed up with boxes of food and brought them in and said, you know, the Lord told us to come by and put this stuff in your cabinets. I said, no, 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 don't put the cabinets in the cabinets. And they opened the cabinets and they saw nothing. And they said, that's why we're putting it in the cabinets because you don't have anything. <laughs> you know, when you don't have anything, you'll, you'll try to be a little bit, you know, discreet. Don't want you to look in there, look somewhere else. And they looked in there and they went, no, that's why the Lord had me come. They filled the cabinets up. That was one of the first times we rec recognized and realized the Lord wants to take care of us no matter what. And from that point on, in that little apartment, we moved to a tiny house. Now, that was a tiny house. The man didn't want us to put any nail holes in the wall. No pictures on the wall at all. It was like, what kind of house is that? But we were so pleased to get a house. It was like, door Jesus and Louis don't live next to that guy with the rolling up the big old music and making the kids' beds roll over. I said, at least we have neighbors and we got a yard. I said, oh, Jesus, we were so happy. And he put us in a little house. And we got that house where fascinated to have that house and he moved us to a little more moderate house and it was like well praise God you know there's levels and even though I've described to you four levels there's lots of little intersecting levels along the way as you move to another major level and then there's a lot of little intersecting levels as you move to another major level and then the and our God took care of us and moved us to this moderate house I remember the first house we bought that first house cost us $50,000. And it needed a major overhaul. <laughs> so we went in there and tore it apart and made it into a house we could live in. And we moved in that house. We're so thrilled that we had a house. And it was a godsend that we had a house. And God gave us that house until we moved to a little bigger house. And then God gave us a new house, overflowing. I'm going to tell you something. When you start out and you start to move up in the apex of the favor of God, and you finally get to a place where you go, Whoa, I've got all this favor coming in all the time. You recognize the favors are happening all the time. That's the overflow of the blessing of God. Don't you want to be in that? Amen. In Luke in Luke chapter 12 and verse 32, it says it like this. Do not fear, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Some people don't recognize and don't realize that God wants to give you more than where you are. He gets great pleasure out of giving you the entire kingdom. 
He's trying to give you the whole kingdom. And we're glad with a quarter. At least I got a quarter. He's trying to give you a house and land and mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers and help. He's trying to help you. And we get satisfied along the way when he says there's more. There's more favor than you realize. He said, I'm trying to move you somewhere. He's trying to make it easy for you to move to the next level. And here's how he does it. He closes doors. Yeah, some people get a door closed and they go, Oh, how are we going to do it? How are we going to make it? The door closed. I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know how we're going to make it. The door's all closed. The door's all closed. And then all of a sudden something else opens up and you go, Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Think, I knew it. I just knew that. Because <laughs> the Lord's trying to get you to another level. Have some of you got a door closing in your life? What he's saying is I'm trying to move you to another level. That's doors that no man can close. They'll open doors that no man can open. And we ought to be praising him for it all along the way. Amen. Set your sights on higher than you have before. If you keep setting your sights on little things, you'll get the little things and you'll not be satisfied. He said, I'm trying to get you to a place where your needs are met. But more than that, you've got more than enough to give to every single good work. In Ruth chapter 3 and verse 9, I want to get to this part. Ruth chapter 3 verse 9 and Ruth comes in and lays down in Boaz's bed on his, by his feet, underneath his, by his feet, which was a custom. If you lay by a man's feet and he tosses the blanket over you, you're going to be okay. They're going to take, he's going to take care of you. So Ruth comes in and lays down by his feet and Boaz says, who are you? It must have been dark in there. He couldn't tell. Who are you? And she says, I'm your servant Ruth. And she says, now spread the corner of your garment over on me. After all, you are my guardian redeemer. Guardian redeemer. What's a guardian redeemer? A guardian redeemer is a family member that is in a position to take care of you whenever you're in trouble. He comes to your rescue and purchases your way out of difficult situation. It's called a guardian redeemer. It was all through the Israeli customs. He's the guardian redeemer. He's a family member that comes in and purchases you out of trouble. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 it says it like this. It says, as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us by glory and virtue. Ruth from chapter 2 to chapter 4, she went from stewardship to ownership. Amen. This is where God's trying to move you. He's trying to move you. She encountered the ministry of Naomi. Naomi, her mother-in-law, an old woman, her mother-in-law, however, this mother-in-law who'd been a mother, who'd been a wife, has now become a mentor and a coach. She's teaching her what to do. She's the one that told her to go down and lay at Boaz's feet. She's telling her along the way what's going to move her to the next level. She's trying to help her. She's trying to get into the life of Ruth and bless her in such a manner because God's poured out favor and blessings on Ruth. Whenever you bless or help someone that has the favor of God, you get the same blessing. Some people don't understand that. They go, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. Get near someone that's being blessed and you bless them. You'll get blessed. Amen. People say, well, they don't need my blessing. They got all that other stuff. They need the blessing of the Lord and you're part of it and you'll be blessed because of it. Amen. Amen. Now, here's something to see. This older woman, Naomi, she's no longer a wife. She's no longer a mother. She's a coach. She's a mentor. She's a coach. That's why you go to church. Some people say, well, I don't need any more church. Now think about this. Is there someone you haven't seen in church for a while? And you say, well, I wonder what they're doing. You need to get them back under the coach. Because even good ball players know you need a coach. 
All good ball players know you need a coach. Good workout people know it's easier if you have a trainer. You get with the coach, he can take you to levels that you haven't been before. It's called the coach. He does something like this. Come on, one more. Come on, come on, come on. One, come on, one more. You can do it. You can do it. And this is what the Bible says. In Ephesians 4 and verse 11, it says it like this. And he himself gave some apostles and prophets and evangelists and teachers. He gave them specifically and some pastors. He said, the pastors are given to you for a gift. They're yours for a gift. It's to help train you to get to the next level. Amen. Amen. People that don't get that, they say, well, I don't need to go to church. I get everything I want at home. You got nothing at home because you don't have a trainer. Some people say, well, I can do just as well by myself. You'll do better if you have somebody show you what to do. This is what the trainer's for. They come in there and they say, come on, what, you can do this. Come on, two, you need to memorize two more scriptures. If you hold on to this, you can knock down the devil. The devil's no big deal for you. You can do all things through Christ that strengthens you. If you listen to the Lord, you can do this stuff. It's because God has presented before you five official trainers. They're there to help take you to the next level. Does that make sense? All of a sudden you're like, oh, that's why we should go to church. <laughs> Amen. And they're to help you get to the next level. And God put those in your life to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. It's to help you get to the next level. He said, I'm trying to show you something. I'm trying to show you something. And by helping Ruth, the Bible says, Naomi was blessed. Look what it says in Ruth chapter 4 and verse 13. Ruth chapter 4 and verse... Well, hang on to that for just a second. Ruth was blessed by helping Naomi. Just because your purpose changes doesn't mean God can't use you. I think that we've been somewhat confused. She's no longer a mother. She's no longer a wife. She's become a mentor. And in this spiritual mm, translation from one place to another, some people think, well, I don't know if I can do that. Listen to me. It's not menopause. It's purpose pause. God is trying to get you to another purpose. He says, I'm going to show you something. He's going to lay out purpose for you. He restored Naomi in her health. He restored Naomi in her purpose. And he set her up for what she was supposed to do. Now Ruth chapter 4. Verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. Wow. Wow. And when he went unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. And the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a close relative, that this may be the name and famous in all of Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. This woman, Naomi, became the nursemaid for this baby that was born to Ruth. And she was restored in her life. She was restored in her age. She was restored in everything. She was blessed physically. Favor fell upon her because she was blessing Ruth. Are you with me? And she was blessed. And it was said, she is this, this daughter of yours, this daughter-in-law of yours who loves you, has blessed you and favored you more than seven sons could have borne you with this one child. Naomi took the child, laid him on her bosom, and became a nursemaid to this boy. And the neighbor women all gave him a name. And the women, they, they said, Said, there has been a son born to Naomi. That because Naomi took care of the child all the time. They always saw the child with Naomi. It was like Naomi's own child. Are you with me? And they called the name of this boy Obed. You know that Obed was the father of Jesse. And Jesse was the father of David. David was in the lineage of Jesus. If there had been no Obed, no Jesus. It was the purpose and plan of God to pour out favor upon Ruth. She gave Obed. Obed gave Jesse. Jesse gave David. David was in the lineage of Jesus. Who is our kinsman redeemer? 
He's been made not only our guardian, he's our kinsman. He is our family member specifically called, he is specifically called to take care of us when things are bad. He's trying to help us out and he's trying to show us there's something more. He's pouring out favor on those that are favored. If you'll help someone favored, he'll pour out blessings on you. Amen. This is really a great lesson for us to learn. God's trying to show us something. We get a little bit confused as to where God's taking us. He says, I'm trying to take you somewhere on purpose. On purpose. Amen. The favor of God is ours in Jesus' name. Now, favor's advantage is upon me. And the Lord said me to declare that to you today. And he said to make sure that you knew that. He said, this church has been given an opportunity by God to walk in divine favor on another level. And it's all in your hands because whatever you give is given back to you. When you give your time or you give your talent, you give your money, it moves us to another level. If you see a church and they got 30,000 people, you go, whoa, they're being, they're being blessed. Yeah, when you got 30,000 people given, you can do something a whole lot different than 30 people given. Are you with me? So God's trying to show you something. Now this morning, we got to pray.